Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I have an important question for you. <clears throat> uh, please remind me of what the last day that the students in Stockholm will be participating in the course, because that's going to govern to some degree uh, the material I cover over the next week or two. What's your last day with us? Next Thursday. Next Tuesday. Next Tuesday. Yeah. Oh my goodness! I'll need to talk. Thursday. 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 Well, I won't have to talk quite as fast. <clears throat> okay, that's fine because next Thursday. Not not this week, but next week. Is that right? Next week. Next week. Yeah. 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 Okay. So that will take us up to spring break, right? Spring break is not next week, but the week after. Okay. So let me give you a preview of coming attractions. We're going to cover random vibrations, and then we're going to talk about flutter analysis for a fairly generic but general uh, type structure. And that will take us up to that Thursday of next week. Then we're going to have a spring break, and I'll give you a chance to recover from the first half of the course and gather your strength again. And then for those of you here in Durham, then we're going to talk about unstable dynamics, which I know you have been eagerly waiting for, right? Those of you in Stockholm are not going to hear about unstable dynamics but you're welcome to read chapter four of the book on your own. And would we let them attend the lectures if, if they wanted to? Yeah. Uh, we would even let, Danny tells me we will let you attend the lectures even after next Thursday if you absolutely insist. And we won't charge you any additional tuition. So we'll, we'll uh, put them on Sakai? On, uh, we'll put the, yeah, we'll put the lectures on Sakai so you can look at them whenever you feel inspired. Um, but for those of you who do not feel a pressing need to understand unstable dynamics, can't imagine anyone would feel that way, but there must be some people in the world who don't understand unstable dynamics. Actually, it's a good thing, right? If everyone understood it, we'd be out of work, right? So uh, you want a number of people to understand it so they'll appreciate what we do, but not too many because otherwise, well, you understand the situation. Okay, so that's the plan. Uh, now, uh, let me hand out the homework for those of you at home. Uh, this is homework number four. Lin Song, there you are. Adam, if you would handle that. Kai, where's Kai? There's Kai. Oh, uh, two, two Kai's, two, two pieces. Danny, uh, Emilio. Alan, Kevin, okay, there you go, all right, now, um, it's really interesting, there was a cultural or geographic distribution in terms of this homework, almost everyone in Stockholm, that probably means one person, then they may have shared the knowledge, uh, everyone in Stockholm realized that you could integrate the transfer function analytically and get an analytical expression for the impulse function. Now, I'm not sure anybody here in Durham realized that. <laughs> but you, now you know, right? Because it's on Sakai. So I'm gonna give you a chance to redeem yourself. All right? So here's what we're gonna do. Uh, let me get my notes here. Let me remind you of what we have. Uh, transfer function and impulse function. Remember, we have a transfer function between alpha naught and alpha. It depends on frequency, right? And we defined a function uh, I alpha, alpha naught, which depends on pi, as equal to one over two pi, the integral of the transfer function over all frequencies, times E I omega T, D omega, and we also discovered that there's a, a dual 
relationship. I guess I'll call this one. The transfer function itself is depends on frequency is equal to the interval over time of the impulse function, the function of time, e to the minus i omega t, et. Okay? And if you're a mathematician, you say the transfer function is the Fourier transform of the impulse function. And the impulse function is the inverse transform of the transfer function. That's what mathematicians say. We just say the impulse function is this integral over the transfer function, and the transfer function is this integral over the impulse function, right? And these are useful. And for the particular example, you can do these integrals analytically. Uh, and this is the one, this is the one I asked you to do in the previous homework, number four, right? And so if you didn't do it before, now's your chance to do it now. And then once you have this function analytically, you can put it in here and analytically, analytically reproduce the transfer function, which you already know. But I want you to do that integral too. All right, so this is, this is the first part of homework number five. So homework number five, and this is true for our friends in Stockholm also. Actually, we already have a homework five. Well, you already have the first one, right? No, no, we, we, we already assigned what you homework five. Oh, uh, oh, was that this what I asked you to do, was it? No. Oh, it was something else. Yes. Well, remind what we're, we're going to keep adding to it. <laughs> we're not, well, I mean, you wouldn't yeah, want me to not, just. It's not on Sakai, though. Well, no, it's not on Sakai. What, what was this? It's not on Sakai, though. It's not on Sakai. It's homework five. We're, we're starting fresh. We're starting fresh, okay. And uh, <laughs> Kevin, Kevin reminded me of what it was, but I've forgotten again. He was forgotten too. Yeah, uh, <laughs> oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah, we'll, we'll give you that. Too. Well, let's, you really want to do that or not? Not really. Okay, we'll forget about that. Okay, <laughs> homework number five: uh, determine. Oh no, let me let me put, put it this way: evaluate. the integrals in one and two and obtain an analytical result. That is an explicit, there'll be terms and signs and cosines and ratios. And the transfer function is a ratio of polynomials and frequency. The impulse function about uh, comes out in terms of exponentials and, so you and the cosines. Do you use the uh, our linear equation? Yeah, yeah. The, you, yeah, the, use the, this is all linear. This okay. is all linear. This is all um, an analytical. So I'll, I'll, put now, it, if, I'll, put, I'll put it to the... Okay. Now, if you want to include the, the nonlinear term and do this, you can actually do it. But that was only done relatively recently. Um, so if you'd done it 10 years ago, you could have written a paper and gotten a publication, but it's too late for that. <laughs> but you can you can actually extend this using the idea of harmonic balance to the nonlinear case. But let's do the linear case. <coughs> linear case only. Now let me remind you of one reason we're doing this, quite aside from the fact that it's like spinach is good for you. Uh, there are transfer functions in the aerodynamic theory, too. So for those of you who are going to learn about aerodynamic theory, you'll find out there's such a thing as an aerodynamic transfer function. Also, it turns out that the aerodynamic transfer functions are not usually simple ratios of polynomials and frequency. In fact, they often come out in terms of Henkel functions or Bessel functions or other transfer functions. But it turns out that people have discovered that if you take those transcendental functions and approximate them by ratios of polynomials, you can get a decent answer. And so once you have polynomials, you can do these integrals analytically if you can factor the polynomial. Of course, it depends on how, how the degree of the polynomial, right? And all that sort of thing. But in this case that you're doing, it's a quadratic. So you can factor in that polynomial. It's not excessively challenging, okay?
All right. Okay. Now, the next thing we were going to do, and uh, let's continue on with that, is now we're going to look at, uh, and by the way, I'm going to give you some more. But I'm going to add to this homework, I think. I'm almost certain that I will. So don't feel that you're being shortchanged by this modest effort. Now we're going to look at random vibrations. And as I mentioned before, we want to do two things. We want to compute the mean of the response in terms of the mean of the input. That is the time average of the response in terms of the time average of the input. Right? And that turns out to be pretty straightforward. Then we want to compute the time average of the mean square because that's a measure of the fluctuations. In fact, what you do for a linear system is you always subtract out the mean from the response so that effectively the fluctuations are about mean or about zero, right? So that makes it easier. Okay, random vibrations. So uh, what do we have here? We have another equation which gives you the response. Uh, we're looking at this particular system again, just as an example. It's, uh, if the input evaluated at time tau times the impulse function, that's this wonderful function up here, depending on t minus tau, d tau, and in, in principle integrated from minus infinity to infinity. Let me say in passing that the lower limit can always be set to zero if you start measuring your response whenever you turn on the excitation. There's, there's an alpha naught, right? Hopefully alpha naught doesn't exist. Well, it might. In, in random vibrations, it might effectively exist forever. But if you're looking at a transient case where the input is, starts at some particular time, you call that time zero, then the lower limit is zero. Also, if you're very careful, I know you will be, when, if you're very careful when you evaluate this impulse function, I'm not sure even our friends in Stockholm were this careful, but if you evaluate the, if you are very careful in evaluating this integral, you will find that this impulse function actually has two representations. It has a certain analytical form if time is greater than zero, but it is zero if time is less than zero. Because the impulse function, what is it? Well, from here, if I set this, the reason this is called an impulse function is if I set this input to a very special value, a very special function, namely the delta function, delta of tau, then on the right-hand side, I just get the impulse function evaluated at tau to zero, i alpha, i alpha alpha at t. Well, I can't get a response until I have an input. <laughs> so that tells you immediately that this function is zero if its argument is less than zero, which means if tau is greater than t, right? If tau is greater than t, then this is less than zero. So this upper limit is not really infinity, it's t. But for many developments, including random vibrations, we want to pretend like the input's been going on forever, right? And it's, it's com more convenient to let the limits be minus plus infinity for much of the theoretical development, and then say, aha, at the end, after we've done all these wonderful calculations, we can really limit the limits, pun intended. That's a little humor there, pun intended. Uh, all right, <laughs> I better stick with it. Okay. All right, so now what we want to do is we want to compute the mean. We want to compute the time average. Thank you. Compute time average or mean. I don't know what the word is in Swedish or other languages. So what is that? The mean, I'll give it the symbol is equal to one over capital T, the integral from minus T over two to plus T over two of alpha of T dt. And we're actually thinking of the limit as capital T gets really large. In practice, when you compute the mean, if you've got a signal, 
it can't really go to infinity, but you make sure it's large enough that the mean settles down. If it's too small and you take different values of the capital T and they're all small, then you'll get different answers depending on capital T, right? But if you make T capital T large enough, eventually it doesn't matter how large it is. After a sufficiently large value, you get the same answer for the mean no matter what. At least that's the idea. If, if, if in fact, it's still fluctuating for what you think is a large T, it's not as large as you think it is. Or you've got something skewy in your signal. Or both. Okay. So, now, this is equation four. So, what are we going to do? We're going to take equation three and put it in the four and then do a little manipulation and come up with a result. So, let's do that. So, uh, putting... Sorry about that. Got carried away. But in equation three and four, what do we get? We get alpha bar is equal to one over capital T and so forth. <clears throat> and then we have uh, uh, the integral from minus infinity to infinity of alpha naught of t i alpha alpha naught of t minus tau d tau and then that whole thing dt right so oh i thank you yes it should be i just did that to see if you're paying attention that's not really i just that was an error so you corrected it. Thank you. Yes, that's 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 very good. Now you look at that and say, gee, what is that? There are only so many tricks you can play with integrals, but one of those tricks is you can integrate by parts, right? That 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 doesn't do any good here. So we, we could try that, but <laughs> it doesn't do us any good. The other trick is if you've got a double integral, you can reverse reverse the order of the in, uh, the integration. That does us a lot of good. And since I've done this before, I know that's the trick to use. So we're going to reverse the order of integration. So here we go. So alpha bar then is in, well, I'm going to do it the other way. Aren't I? Here we go from minus infinity to infinity uh, d tau. That's on the outside, right? And then on the inside, we have dt. The integral of 1 over t minus t over 2 to plus t over 2. Uh, and now I need to do what? Ah! So I need to uh, put alpha naught of tau outside this one. And I alpha alpha t minus tau in there, right? I'm sorry. I think you're missing the bracket. Uh, probably so. Where would you like the bracket here? Okay. Now, hmm. that's not quite what I wanted. Ah, I need to do one other thing. I do need to make a change of variable. Right? Yes. I do. Sorry about that. Uh, I can do this a couple of different ways. Um, let me uh, aside. Remember, I had this.
It's also true. Ah, I could assign this as a homework problem. No, no. It's also true that this is is that the alpha of t minus tau times i l alpha of tau d tau. Both of these statements are equivalent and true. And one way to see that is to make a change of variable. Um, for example, uh, let's see. I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip this but, and start over in effect. Uh, look at five. If I if I define a new variable, tau t star, t star. No, maybe tau star. Should be alpha decided to be zero and six D alpha and Yes, it should be. Thank you. Um, if uh, if I define a new variable tau star, which I'll define as T minus tau. So I'm thinking of I'm thinking of replacing the variable tau for a given T with tau <laughs> star. Right? Then in five, what does five become? I have alpha of t equal minus infinity to infinity, alpha naught of tau. The tau is equal to t minus tau star, right? So I like that. T, t minus tau star. And then this is i alpha alpha naught of tau star by definition. But d tau is really minus d tau star, right? Minus d tau star. But now, when tau is equal to minus infinity, tau star is equal to plus infinity. And <laughs> this becomes minus infinity. But of course, this minus sign and the reversal of the, of the limits cancel, right? So I'm right back to here, except this is really tau star, but I, I can, once I've done the manipulation, I can call it tau again if I want to, right? I just introduced tau star, so it'd be a little easier to see what the manipulation is. So either either of these two representations is fine, and since I've done this calculation before, even though I forgot it momentarily, I know I really want to use this <laughs> version, right, rather than this version when I try to compute the mean. So now we're going to start over again <laughs> and use six, right? E six. So uh, let's do that. So now if I put, uh, yeah, I, I'm going to put the, uh, I'm going to place six in four, where four is the definition of of alpha. I mean, right? So let's see. Alpha mean now is, I'm going to do it one more time, 1 over t, integral of minus t over 2, the plus t over 2, of uh, alpha naught of t, up, the integral from minus infinity to infinity of alpha naught of uh, t minus tau. times I alpha alpha naught of tau, d tau, and now dt, okay? And now I'm going to reverse order of integration, and then I'm going to get one and one. I hope. We'll see. So then we're going to have what? The integral over minus infinity to infinity. Uh, I'm going to with respect to t first. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. T first, so that's going to be 1 over T integral from minus T over 2 to plus T over 2 of um, 1. I've got alpha naught of T minus tau dT, and then I have I alpha alpha naught tau 
E tab, right? But this thing inside is what? With if T, this capital T gets really large. So for any finite small T, <laughs> right? Oh, excuse me, for any finite tau, if T, capital T gets really large, this is just the mean of alpha naught, right? So, hold on to that thought. So then alpha bar is equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity of the mean of alpha naught times uh, I alpha alpha of tau d tau. Of course, this is a constant, so that goes outside the integral. Um, and so this is alpha bar equals alpha naught bar, this integral. And what is that integral? If you look back, we had an expression a moment ago, if I can find it. Oh, there it is. We had an expression which was the transfer function. The function of frequency can be represented by the minus integral, integral of minus infinity to plus infinity of I al alpha naught of T e to the minus i omega t dt, right? If I look at that and look at this, they're the same if I set omega equal to zero, right? And therefore, I identify this as the transfer function evaluated omega equal to zero. So, huh, that's fantastic. Alpha bar equals alpha bar naught times the transfer function at omega equal to zero, which makes physical sense. Right, it's the transfer function when the frequency is zero. It's the static transfer function, right? No damping, no inertia, just stiffness. So we, this is a lovely result and simple enough. I guess I'll call this equation seven. So you would hope that there's a counterpart of this for the mean square, but unfortunately, the situation is much more complicated. And so let's look now at the mean, let's look at the time average. Of alpha squared or alpha squared bar the mean. We're happy with the mean before I do the mean square. The people in Durham are happy Are the people in Stockholm happy. We're happy. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to define a new new function. Again, uh, someone became famous for doing this. I'm going to define a new function, which is a generalization of the idea of a mean square. And so um, the mean square is defined as 1 over t the integral from minus t over 2 to plus t over 2 of alpha of t quantity squared dt. That is the mean square. But then I'm going to find something which I'm going to call the correlation function, which is a more uh, elaborate function. It's the following. It's 1 over t integral from minus t over 2 to plus t over t alpha of t times alpha of t plus tau dt. So this is a function where I, I multiply the function by itself, but I have a time difference between one version of the function and the next. OK? And why do I do this? Well, a variety of reasons. One is uh, I might want to use this to decide whether I have a random input or a random output. And the practical definition of a random input or random output is if tau gets very large, this function better go to zero, right? If it doesn't go to zero, then it's not really a random function. Because if I have, if 
if I have a random time series, what happens now and what happens a thousand years from now should be uncorrelated. Now, they shouldn't. I'm, it depends on how you look at the universe, but most people would take that point of view. Okay. I mean, we could become very philosophical here, but but that's that's the notion. Okay. And so, uh, one big question is, does the correlation function tend to zero as tau goes to infinity? And if the answer is yes, then we're probably dealing with a random function. Also note that if I really want the mean square, it's equal to the correlation function when tau is zero, right? When I'm evaluating this integral with zero time delay, if you will, then I'm, get, I'm going to get the mean square. Another way of thinking of it is the mean square is the most correlated part of the time series of the random function. Okay. Now, this is a function of time. And since we've been talking about functions of time and how they're related to other functions of frequency, you might be tempted to say, why don't we take the Fourier transform of this correlation function and call it something? It's not called usually the Fourier transform of the correlation function, it's called the power spectral density. Now we could call it something else, but almost all the literature you'll read <laughs> will call it the power spectral density, so we are too. It releases the fact that the person who did this originally was an electrical engineer who was interested in, in random signals and power systems, right? Spectral is usually a word denoting as something to do with frequency, right? So he was looking at power and he was looking at frequency representations. So uh, let's call this equation H. And let's define the following. Uh, I'm just going to give it a star. Although sometimes we give it a different symbol and call it capital C as another alternative. But it's just the Fourier transform of the correlation. Now, uh, this is equation nine. But since we're now experts in transforms, we know there's an inverse relationship, right? We know that if I want to compute the, if I, for some, if somehow, if I were able to find the power spectral density, if I were able to find the transform of the correlation function, then I could compute the, uh, the correlation function itself by doing the usual thing. which is this, function of frequency plus I omega t tau d omega. Right. And by the way, if I'm interested in particular in the mean square, which is the correlation function at tau equals zero, then it's just one over two pi As I said, tau equals zero, right? So if I can ever find the power spectral density, I integrate over all frequencies and I get the mean square, which is what I'm most interested in, although knowing the correlation function is sometimes interesting too. Right? Uh, so what one can do is the following. With this kind of definition, one can relate the correlation function of alpha, the output, to the correlation function of the input. And that's actually given in the text. It's a long, messy looking result, but it's there. On the other hand, the relationship, and one reason you do all this, the relationship between the power spectrum of the input, power spectrum of alpha naught, to the power spectrum of the output is much simpler. 
That's why power spectra are interesting and SO rise became famous. It turns out, I'm omitting about five pages of algebra. It turns out that the power spectrum of the output is equal to the power spectrum of the input times something. You gotta be times something, right? And it's gotta involve the dynamics of the system. So it's gotta involve either the impulse function or as it turns out, the transfer function. And it's the transfer function times the transfer function. After all, it's a square, right? So it's not too surprising you get a square of the transfer function. Except it's the transfer function now evaluated not at omega, but at minus omega, which means it's the complex conjugate. So I'm multiplying a function times its complex conjugate. And when I multiply a complex function times its conjugate, I always get a real number, no longer imaginary. The imaginary parts have gone away. Okay. You can also show that the, for any really any real physical phenomena, these power spectra are you'll be happy to hear real numbers too. <laughs> okay. So uh, th then when we integrate them, we'll get a real number, which is good because the mean square should be a real number. But we're going to use the, we're using a complex number and its conjugate to get the real number. So this is, this is the famous result in the power spectral density theory and uh, is used in electrical engineering, chemical engineering, aerospace engineering, mechanical engineering. We use it mainly in terms of gusts. That is, we're going to represent the, the gust input to the aircraft in terms of a random process so we know its power spectral density. How do we know it? We go out, someone goes out at great expense and measures it. <laughs> you got to go out in the atmosphere and measure. In principle, you can solve that. I suppose you can principle you can solve the major those equations and compute it, but no one's ever succeeded in doing that. Uh, so you go out in, in the real world and you measure that. So you, you measure this in terms of representation of the gusts. You know the transfer function of whatever system you're dealing with. You perform this operation. You get the output power spectral density. You do the integral of the frequency, which turns out for a system with low damping, you can do that integral analytically. How about that? That's good. But you could do it numerically if you had to. So that's it. Isn't that good? That's good. Now, you may want to see the derivation of this. You may not want to take my word for it. This is true. So I'm going to ask you to read the text. And, and then you can also do something else. You can relate alpha, alpha, naught, star, omega to the input. Oops, thank you. What do I mean by that? Well, the, it, the cor it, this is the, the Fourier transform of the correlation function. What do I mean by, by this? It's still the same thing as before. Alpha of T times alpha naught, alpha naught of T plus tau dt. This is the correlation between the output and the input. It's sometimes called the cross correlation, right? It's cross between output and input. These were the so-called autocorrelations up here as the correlation of the function with itself. And the reason this relationship is interesting, and I'm going to ask you to, it's given in the text. The, the actual answer is given in the text, but the derivation is not. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you to derive it. You know, it's helpful to know the answer when you derive something, right? So I'm giving you a big hint. Um, and it involves, it turns out, involves just one of the transfer functions, one transfer function, not a, not, not a product. What does that mean? That means if somehow I knew the power spectrum of the input and the cross spectrum of the output, I could use this relationship to find the transfer function of the airplane. So there's certain systems where I want to measure, I want to have the power spectrum of the input 
And then I know the input, but I also know the output. I measure the output. And then measuring the output and the input, I can construct a correlation function. I can take the Fourier transform with the powers of cost factor. And from that, I can measure, in, in, at least imply, uh, in, infer a, a measurement of the transfer function. Okay. And that would be interesting to do because presumably I have a math model over here where I've constructed the math model of the transfer function. And I can see how my measured transfer function compares to the, uh, the calculated one. And if they differ substantially, I know I have a lousy math model from my transfer function. I might want to do something about that. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so homework number five. Derive relationship between C star alpha alpha naught and C star alpha naught alpha naught. I suggest you look at the derivation of this relationship. <laughs> Knowing as a guide to how you want to derive this relationship, what you really do is formally you derive the relationship between the correlation functions. I'll tell you broadly how you do it. And then you take a Fourier transform. You'll end up with a triple integral. You'll have to do some change of variables. You'll have to invert the order of integration and it'll be a little bit of a it'll take you five or six pages, but you should do it once in your life. And this is your chance. So this is the autocorrelation and the cross correlation. Say again? The autocorrelation? Alpha naught, alpha naught, and uh, the cross correlation. Yeah, yeah. This is the autocorrelation. well this is the power spectrum. This is the auto power spectrum. This is the this is the power spectrum of alpha naught, alpha naught, and this is the cross spectrum, right? You talk about cross correlation or cross spectra. So this is this is input, strictly input. This is cross between output and input. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Make sure I'm getting all my pages. Now. Okay. I think that's they'll they'll keep you busy for a while. And this will be due a week from today, right? Okay, now, with all that in hand, let's do some flutter analysis and gust response analysis, which is the bread and butter of our analysis. I mean, we, we, we agonize through these methods, right? I mean, one hopes they're going to be useful, and if they don't prove to be useful, you should ask for your money back, right? But they will prove to be useful. They will prove to be useful. Okay. So, um, fine. I'll be doing that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, dun, 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 dun. So, we want to do flutter analysis. And Gus is. Just announced. Which one we want to do first? Gus. I have a vote for Gus. That's that's a, that's good. And we did we did not have a conversation before class, right? But I like that answer. That's good. And we're going to do Gus now. But we've just been talking about power spectra, right? And that's that's mainly all right. Now. Same thought. Uh, very good. Yeah, great minds always think alike. Okay, so uh, now we have to decide what system representation are we going to do the gust analysis for? And I, I'm going to suggest that we leap ahead and do what real air elasticians do, right? And Dan's going to check me on this. What real air elasticians do is the following. Here's the, first of all, they write down the equation of motion for the structure. Then they write down a representation for the aerodynamics. And if they're doing a gust analysis, they compute the transfer function, including the structure and the aerodynamics. And once they have the transfer function, you square it, multiply the input 
discuss power spectra, get the output response, and you're done, right? Yeah. That, right. And not only that, you probably have a piece of software that someone else has written a zillion years ago. You maybe have bought it from a reliable source uh, that does all the heavy duty work. But you should at least understand to some degree what's inside the software. So when you get a ridiculous answer, you know you're getting a ridiculous answer. Okay. All right. So here's the here's the equation motion for the structure. And I'll throw in a little structural damping just to make life interesting. And then on the right hand side we have some generalized forces. Uh, one is due to motion. Remember when, when this when this wing or aircraft moves, it has aerodynamic forces on it due to its motion. But there's also forces on it due to the gusts. Okay. Okay. Now let, let's let's uh, I'm going to start again with equation one. Let me interpret this equation for you. First of all, I'm thinking of a planar wing structure. I mean, we could do even more general structures, but this is pretty general and suffices for 9% of what one does in practice. So I've got a, a, a deflection of a wing. X and Y are the, are the coordinates of some point on the wing, right? Say X is in the flow direction, Y is in the span direction. I've got some, let me draw a picture. Okay. Here's my, here's at least half of the wing. So you know x is this way, and y is this way, and x y just tells me I'm at some point, and it has a deflection that varies with time t, right? But I'm going to represent that. This is where the q's come from, as some coordinates which depend on time, times some wonderful functions x y which someone like Dan is going to provide. In fact, I'm, I'm going to ask you, if we're going to do a calculation, you're going to give us the, the mode shape you computed for the wing you tested the wind on the other day, right? All right, right. Okay, why not? Came out of a reliable fine element code, and you trust them, right? You're, you're a reliable person, so for reliable. And, uh, <clears throat> okay, so you're going to have these functions, and that's that, and you substitute this into Lagrange's equations, and this is the equation of motion you get as a consequence. Where m sub m, we're thinking you're going to give us eigenmodes, right? Natural modes, which have orthogonality properties and all those wonderful things that yeah. people normalize to unit function. Well, whatever. Well, you have to tell us how it's normalized. But this, the fact, definition of this is the integral of the mass per unit area, which might vary with uh, position. It's okay if it does. Um, times the mode shape squared. Ah. Dx dy. And if you're really nice to Danny, he might even give you these functions. He might even do the integrals for you. Because the software you have doesn't, right? <laughs> he's not he's not being too generous. He's got a nice piece of software. Um, the omega sub m are the natural frequencies. With which Danny is also going to provide. Uh, and we're going to probably use, how many modes are we going to use? Five? Five is a good number? Whatever. Let's do two. Oh, no, 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 more, more than two. <laughs> well, you can do the two to start, but I think you yeah, should do one. Four more. Yeah, oh, whatever. Zetas of M, these are the damping ratios, critical, so-called critical damping ratios. And the answer is we have no, well, I started to say we have no clue. That's not quite true. Uh, someone has built a similar wing sometime in the past and gone out in the lab and measured the critical damping ratio for that wing. And typically, it's a number like 0.01 or 0.02, and so we're going to throw in a number like that. In fact, if you're serious you might, and you're concerned that the answer might be sensitive to damping ratio, you would run the calculation for several different damping ratios. And... Uh, and see if it varies significantly, right? The answer varies significantly. Uh, 
one of the disconcerting things, it doesn't often happen, but it can happen. You can put in structural damping and actually drop, i.e. lower the flood speed. I don't know if that's ever happened to you or not, but occasionally that happens. And then you think, not in this case, not in this case but, but for some, some cases. When that happens, well, what do you do when that happens? It's a bad day, right? <laughs> Not a bad day. <laughs> then they leave you alone. They leave here. <laughs> have to leave it up. Yeah, you have to hope that, that it doesn't change very much. But there are cases where it changes a lot, and then and it lowers it, right? And then, do you believe the answer or not? No, that that's still a question mark. That's that's one of the things that that's discussed in hushed tones among the the aerolasticians. They hope the chief engineer <laughs> never hears about it. Okay, anyway. All right. So we got that. Now, what are the Q sub M? Uh, it's the integral of the aerodynamic pressure due to the motion times psi m dx dy. It's the generalized force, right? It's integrated over the area. So this has the units of, of, uh, of force. Right? Pressure times an area of force, and then this mode shape is non dimensional and then the, this is QM due to the motion. And uh, there's a comparable expression due to the gauss. And since we're using a linear model, we are assuming, consistent with the linear model, that the aerodynamic pressure due to the motion can be added, superimposed, with the aerodynamic pressure due to the gauss. If you had a nonlinear model, then you might want to agonize about that, although usually even if you run a Navier Stokes code or some elaborate nonlinear CFD code, you usually still make this assumption. And it's sort of like, you know, you go to all this trouble and make all these wonderful calculations, and then you make an assumption like this, and you wonder if it destroys the, uh, the, the goodness of having gone to all that trouble. But we won't worry about that. Okay. Now, we need an expression for the aerodynamic pressure. Now, Danny has a code that will produce that too, but I'm going to let you. I'm going to do something different, so you can do something too. Uh, we're going to use a very simple form of the aerodynamic pressure. Uh, it turns out that within the framework of linear aerodynamic theory, if you let the Mach number get really high, the form for the aerodynamic pressure simplifies a great deal. It's kind of interesting. Uh, uh, actually, in some ways, the most complicated mathematical model is the incompressible flow model, uh, which was historically the one that was first created by a guy named Theodor Singh, at least in the United States, and perhaps Wagner and some others in Germany. Uh, and uh, it's very elaborate. His analysis is very elaborate. It's in the book. Uh, it turns out he solved the two-dimensional incompressible flow problem using complex variable theory. If you go through that derivation, it's intricate. And it's a wonderful exercise. It turns out the method used doesn't apply to 3D flow. <laughs> it doesn't apply to compressible flow. It's a dead end in terms of, it was, it was brilliant and very important and used for many years because Airplanes flew at relatively low speeds, and you know, incompressible assumption wasn't too bad. And the aspect ratio, the span was very large, so a 2D assumption wasn't too bad. So, and even now, people in general aviation, for some preliminary analysis, may use Theodorson's theory. But anyway, it's 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 that's why we're not doing the incompressible case. It's the hard case, mathematically speaking. So we're going to do the easy case initially, which is high Mach number. Okay, and so uh, here's the expression we're going to use. The pressure on the wing is equal to minus, there's a minus sign. This is the net pressure from top to bottom, or bottom to top, actually. The density of the flow, the mean density, the, air, yeah. the speed of sound times dw dt plus U infinity 
dw dx. Remember, x is in the flow direction, so this is the slope in the flow direction, right? And that, of course, is the velocity, right? The velocity of the wing. So this is the this is the pressure due to the motion. And then if you want the gust, you simply add in here minus yeah. W I'll put a WG dot. It's the gust velocity. Right? <coughs> gust velocity. So we're thinking of this gust as it really has components in all directions. But the part of the gust that really creates a force on the wing is the, is, is the gust velocity normal, normal to the wing. And where do we get this gust velocity? Well, for our purposes, uh, we only need the transfer function. So we're going to assume we're going to assume sinusoidal motion, right, to compute the transfer function, right? So to compute transfer function, uh, assume sinusoidal motion. So we're going to assume that W uh, goes like W bar of X, Y. Oops, thank you. E, I, omega, T. Uh, w, G dot is some W, G dot bar, just the amplitude, the gust velocity times E, I, omega, T. And of course, uh, if I want to, I can write this a little more explicitly as W equals the sum over all these modes, five or whatever the number is, q bar e i omega t psi m of x y. Okay, I probably should give these other equations some numbers. With all that, you can compute the transfer function. But the transfer function is not going to be just one object. It's going to be it's going to be a matrix of objects, right? Because there's going to be a transfer function associated with all of these modes. If there are five modes, there are going to be 25 transfer functions. So it's going to be a five by five matrix. And so, uh, what you want to end up with is, you want to end up with, uh, well, no, I guess that's not right. No, no, it, I'm sorry. It's still going to be five transfer functions. It's going to be H21 WG dot, right, the function of frequency, right? And then there's going to be um, HQ2, and so So, you've got to compute all those transfer functions. Yeah. Ah, no, you're still that. I'm going to end up with the matrix. Okay. Okay, so you're going to have to keep it. You're going to have to keep it all those transfer functions. Right. And then what are you going to do? I don't think I'll get that part. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, I'm not going to do, not going to do it right away. I'm just give, I'm preparing you. You're not going to do it right away. I mean, you've got a homework assignment number five. That's two weeks from now. This is all going to happen a bit later. But I'm going to give our friends in Stockholm a chance to think about this too. Maybe the the thing to do, but not not for uh, uh, next. See this homework. This homework number five is due next Tuesday. Golly, I have to make sure the people in Stockholm have a chance to do this. I'll let them turn it in after the after the spring break, right? Let us all turn it in after the spring. Break. Yeah. yeah. So the first, and we're going to do several things. First thing we're going to do is just compute the transfer. Right? But then, after we get the transfer function, we're going to use that wonderful input-output relationship involving the power spectrum, and and use that. And then eventually, we're actually going to get the mean square, right? So let's just do the transfer function because that'll be that'll be challenging, right? And then we'll and then we'll do the rest of it. So now you know how to do do a gust response analysis more or less. If you only use one mode, 
Let, let's talk about that. Maybe it allows them to do one mode first, you think? Why not? Before you do multiple. If you only did one mode, then you'd, you'd have the power spectrum of associated with Q, Q1 would be the transfer function Q1 WG dot omega times H Q1 WG minus omega times B WG WG. I have to tell you what this is, right? I have to tell you what this is, but let's not. So if you only had one mode, you'd get this. And then if you only had one mode, and you wanted the uh, you want the mean square of, of W itself, which is Q1 times Psi1, right? Well, the mean square of that would be the mean square of this, oops, thank you, times Psi1 squared, right? And the reason I was thinking about you're going to have 25 terms is because when you do more than one mode, you're going to have cross coupling between the modes. All right? You're going to have some terms involving Q1 squared, but then you're also going to have some terms involving Q1 times Q2 and all that stuff. But a common assumption would be to do it one mode at a time and then add up the results. Anyway. Now, was that too fast? No, not too fast? No? Okay. Now's a chance to ask a question. I'm gonna stop talking. I've probably talked too much today. But that's what we're gonna do. Not right away, because you got a homework number five, but that's what you got. That's, that's the gust analysis. And then we also have to figure out how we're gonna use the same model, but use the same model to do a flutter analysis. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. In flutter analysis, well, no, I don't want to talk about that. I'll, I'll wait and save that for next time. Uh, but we're, we can use the same mathematical model to do flutter analysis as what we do to us analysis. Questions? Questions? Sankholm, are you still with us? Yeah, we are here. Thank you. Good. I'm happy for you. Any questions? Uh, no questions. <laughs> when when people do not have questions, I always think, see that, that that's wonderful. They must understand everything, or more likely, <laughs> they're still trying to figure out what question to ask. Is that is that where we are? Okay. We'll 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 go back and and. Uh, Review this uh, and start in uh, a little further back, and because I know I went through that fairly quickly. But but what I've described, aside from the fact that we use a simplified aerodynamic theory, this is what people do. Let me read that for now. So probably get accurate of the large Mach numbers. This computer is. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's right. We're at Mach two. This one will probably give you quite a decent answer. It will not give you a great answer at a Mach number one or Mach number 0.7, unfortunately. But uh, but uh, if, if you have a supersonic airplane, uh, probably the first thing you're going to do is a piston theory analysis just to get a ballpark answer and then and then go to the more elaborate aerodynamic theory later on. Okay. I'm exhausted. I know you're still <laughs> fresh and eager. I'm exhausted. So I'm, let's stop here. And we'll meet again on 